Myths abound on social media regarding the latest decisions by the Supreme Court, especially when it comes to Christians now allegedly being able to discriminate against the LGBTQ community. So we'll debunk some of those narratives that you've seen floating around on Instagram and elsewhere. Also, I've got a monologue to close out this episode to commemorate the end of this year's Pride Month. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Thursday. Yes, Thursday. Hope everyone's having a wonderful week. First of all, I apologize. I'm a little bit more nasally than usual. I'm getting over a cold, but it's all good. But I am sorry to those of you who have to bear with me with the sound of my cold-ridden voice. Um, We have a lot to talk about today. I hope you listen to Monday and Wednesday's episodes with Nancy Piercy. Isn't she just brilliant for those of you who listened? We talked about masculinity, about the body, why matter matters according to God. So go listen to those episodes. We have a lot to get to today since we haven't been able to cover the news for the past few days. I hope everyone had a wonderful 4th of July. 4th of July is my maybe one of my favorite days of the year. It's always been one of my favorite holidays. I love the summer. I love all the festivities that come along with it. I love the fireworks. I love the hot dogs, all that good stuff. We had a very chill day just trying to escape the heat. I hope you had a wonderful celebration uh, with your friends and family celebrating the privilege and the blessing that it is to live in the United States. Um, Even with all the craziness that we see on a daily basis here, there's really nowhere else in the world I would rather live. So thank you, Lord, for uh, making me a born and raised American. All right, before we get into some of this stuff that you guys have been sending me and asking me about, asking me to debunk these some of these Supreme Court cases and then a couple things at the end, uh, I just want to remind you that we've got new merch available at AllieMerch.com. So I've been posting some clips where I'm wearing my The Rainbow Belongs to God shirt, and you guys have been commenting where did you get that shirt? That's available at AllieMerch.com, even though it's not quote unquote pride month anymore. That's true all year long. It will be true forever and ever that the rainbow belongs to God. But our newest stuff is just flying off the shelves. You guys had an amazing response to it, which I knew that you would. The do the next right thing uh, shirts. And then on the back, it has a cool design that says do the next right thing in faith with excellence and for the glory of God, which is what we say a lot on this show. And we've got Relata Bro colors. Guys, you've been asking me for merch that you can wear. Relata Bros, I'm thankful for you. We've got a uh, black and white and then a cream colored and black option for you related bros out there. Of course, related gals could wear this too. Um, So we've got a lot of options. And then our Razor Respectful Ruckus shirts. You guys are loving these. That's because they're super cute. I wear mine all the time. And just for sizing, I mean, I am seven months pregnant, but I like the XL. It's very loose. So it just depends on what you want. Like I would... I don't even know. It just depends on the fit. It depends on the fit. I think if I weren't pregnant, I would probably be, um, I'd probably be wearing a large. So it just depends on what you like. Uh, yeah. So AllieMerch.com, check that out. All right. Let's go ahead and get into some of the stuff that we have to cover today. I'm going to try not to make this like a mega, mega long episode, but no promises. You guys know I'm very verbose. Let's first talk about this 303 Creative versus Lennis case that was decided by the Supreme Court last week. This has to do with the graphic designer, Lori Smith in Colorado, who did not want to create a website celebrating uh, homosexuality or celebrating gay unions. And so you've probably seen a lot of takes online that said, oh, the Supreme Court now says that businesses can discriminate against LGBTQ people. Oh my goodness, they're taking this country backwards. They got rid of affirmative action. What are we going to do without affirmative action? Oh, they got rid of Biden's student loan plan. How are we ever going to survive this? You've probably seen a lot of drama over the past few days. Very little actual intellectual analysis, very few on the left, 
uh, trying to rebut uh, the constitutionality of the decision. That's what you see a lot, even with Roe v. Wade. You say, oh my goodness, we're taking the country back with uh, backwards with this Dobbs decision. This is so terrible, but very few reasoned uh, perspectives on why the decision was constitutionally wrong when Dobbs was decided last year. That's because the left in general in general, thinks that judges and justices should be activist-driven, that they should simply be ideologues that are carried by the whims of the loudest progressives in the country. They're not concerned about applying the law in accordance with the Constitution. They're concerned with what they want, and they would actually like justices and judges uh, to be to be beholden to the will of the people. Whereas those of us over here, we say, okay, we might not always agree with the decisions that the Supreme Court justices make who have been appointed by Republican presidents, um, but we want them to interpret the law in light of the Constitution, which means that they're not quite as predictable as the left-wing justices are and left-wing judges are. We always know which way they're going to rule. We don't always know, for example, which way Roberts is going to rule. And I think he's been wrong several times or which way um, Amy Coney Barrett is going to rule or Kavanaugh is going to rule because they're not ideologues. And so that's one difference between the left and the right. You're not going to see a lot of leftists saying, oh, here is why constitutionally and logically this case was decided incorrectly. It's all about the feels. And they just happen to be wrong in their analysis, by the way, especially of this 303 creative case. And we'll get into why. So let me give you a little bit of background. In September 2016, Lori Smith, the owner of a company specializing in graphic and web design called 303 Creative, filed a complaint against various Colorado officials, including the members of the state's Civil Rights Commission because she wanted to explain her religious beliefs about marriage between one man and one woman on her website and in communications with prospective clients. But Colorado's Anti-Discrimination Act, the CADA, prohibited her from doing this, violating her First Amendment rights. This is according to National Review, by the way, this summary. CADA, this is according to the SCOTUS filing of her case, prohibits all public accommodations from denying the full and equal enjoyment of its goods and services to any customer based on his race, creed, disability, sexual orientation, or other uh, statutorily enumerated trait. Um, The law defines public accommodation broadly to include almost every public facing business in the state, either state officials or private citizens may bring actions to enforce The law and a variety of penalties can follow any violation. So instead of acting and wanting and waiting to be punished, this was a preemptive case. So Smith filed a preliminary injunction to clarify her rights. This is called a pre-enforcement action. So you're seeing some people, like I saw that propaganda account, what is it, like Matt XIV or something, who just always just post misinformation about different uh, political events and Supreme Court decisions said something along the lines of the uh, central request in this complaint uh, that apparently uh, Lori Smith said, made a request on her website to create some kind of uh, page that celebrated gay marriage, that that was Uh, the person that they said filed it is actually a straight man and he's been married and he has no idea who Lori Smith is. And so this was all centered on some fake request that the allegation from the left goes Lori Smith and her team just made up. And so this case shouldn't even exist. But that wasn't central to the case. Uh, now, we don't. the request they're saying, by the way, is legitimate. It really did come through. Now, whether this person was just trolling or not, we don't know. But that wasn't central to this case. This was a preemptive action saying that according to the CADA, she can't exercise her First Amendment rights in Uh, publicly expressing what she believes about marriage and sexuality according to her faith. Um, 
So the 10th Circuit ruled against Smith in July 2021, saying that CADA permissibly compels a graphic and website design company to offer wedding websites that celebrate same-sex marriages if it is going to offer wedding websites that celebrate opposite-sex marriages. So Smith just wanted, in the state of Colorado, to be able to exercise her First Amendment rights freely in the things that she creates. She realized that if she had a website design company that she would have eventually be compelled to create design celebrating that which she disagrees with, that which, um, according to her faith, uh, may be sin. And so she was ruled against. It went to the Supreme Court. She's represented by Alliance Defending Freedom. So thankful for their work and other groups like them. And we'll get into what SCOTUS specifically ruled. Just a uh, just a spoiler, it is not that businesses can just discriminate universally against LGBTQ people. That's not what the ruling says. Uh, but let me pause. Let me tell you about our first sponsor for the day. And that is Carly Jean Los Angeles. You guys know if you've been listening to this podcast for any amount of time, how much I love Carly Jean Los Angeles. I love the family that runs Carly Jean Los Angeles. I love Carly. Uh, but I also just love the products that they sell. And I'm wearing all Carly Jean Los Angeles right now. I'm wearing this button down, which is super comfortable. It's been great for maternity. I'm wearing these cute pants. Um, I love these jeans. I have them in different colors. These are like the kind of washed out black, but I also have them in just regular denim. And then these shoes are even from Carly Jean Los Angeles, these adorable sandals. And also this belly band. I'm wearing a belly band right now since I'm about seven and a half months pregnant. And that allows me to wear all of my cute Carly Jean Los Angeles pants, even when they don't fit over my giant belly. So I just love Carly Jean Los Angeles in all stages of life, whether I'm not pregnant or postpartum or whether I am pregnant or postpartum. They just make me feel good in my skin. They're super comfortable, really high quality. And this is a company that aligns with our values and is fighting for the things that you and I are too. And so you can feel really good about spending your money at this woman's clothing store. So go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use promo code AllieB for 20% off your order, excluding final sale items. CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com, promo code AllieB. CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com, code AllieB. All right. So last week, the Supreme Court uh, ruled in favor of 303 Creative slash Lori Smith. So Gorsuch, Roberts, Thomas, Alito, Kavanaugh, Barrett ruled in Smith's favor. And then the three reliably progressive uh, leftist justices filed a dissenting opinion. This is what they held. The First Amendment prohibits Colorado from forcing a website designer to create expressive designs, speaking messages with which the designer disagrees. Obviously, that is the heart of the First Amendment. That's the heart of free speech, that the state cannot compel you to say something that you don't want to say, can't compel you or prohibit you uh, from saying something. And uh, that I mean, that's why we have the Constitution. That's why we have the First Amendment. That's a huge reason why this nation was even founded. I mean, just how crazy it is to think about how far Colorado has fallen. I mean, not so long ago, Colorado was a reliably red state. Not so long ago, so was California, but especially Colorado. And just the infiltration of progressivism and weaponized progressivism. And I just want to say, like, by the way, this comes from the same side who is constantly fear-mongering about how homeschoolers are taking over the world, <laughs> how Christian conservatives are the ones just vying for power, that Christian nationalists are going to finally exact dominion over the United States and it's going to turn into the a fascist handmaid's tale, whatever it is. And You'll see Christians who identify as progressive or vote Democrat. They're like, oh, yeah, Republicans just want power. Democrats don't want power. Are you kidding me? They're constantly weaponizing the state to force people to say and celebrate the things that they believe in. Um, this is the same state in which Jack Phillips has been harassed for over a decade by LGBTQ activists trying to force him to make a cake, not just for them as customers, but specifically 
cakes that celebrate things like uh, gay weddings or celebrate so-called transitions, which he won't do because it's not in accordance with his faith and the state should not be able to compel him to do that. So here is the majority opinion or part of it written by Justice Gorsuch. Um, It says here, Colorado seeks to put Miss Smith to a similar choice. If she wishes to speak, she must either speak as the state demands or face sanctions for expressing her own beliefs, sanctions that may include compulsory participation and remedial training, filing periodic compliance reports as officials deem necessary and paying monetary fines. Um, he says that's enough to represent an impermissible abridgment of the First Amendment's right to speak to speak freely. Countless other creative professionals, too, could be forced to choose between remaining silent, producing speech that violates their beliefs, or speaking their minds and incurring sanctions for doing so. It is difficult to read the dissent and conclude we are looking at the same case. Uh, when the dissent finally gets around to... The question of whether a state can force someone who provides her own expressive services to abandon her conscience and speak its preferred messaging instead, uh, the dissent reimagines the facts of this case from top to bottom. The dissent chides us for deciding a pre-enforcement challenge, but it ignores the Tenth Circuit's finding that Ms. Smith faces a credible threat of sanctions unless she conforms her views to the state's. So this is about the First Amendment. So ask yourself, ask your progressive friends, like, should a gay designer be forced by the state of Alabama to create a website that says gay people are going to hell? Should Alabama be forced to, or should Alabama be able to force a gay man to create a cake or to create a product or to write a song that celebrates um, or that affirms this message that homosexuality is an abomination. Why don't you think about it that way? Because it's not just the rights of Lori Smith. It's not just the rights of conservatives. It's not just the First Amendment rights of Uh, Christians that we're talking about here. We are talking about the First Amendment applying to everyone. I don't think that a gay person, a Muslim person, a black person, a Christian person, a conservative, a progressive should be forced by the state to say something that they don't want to say or should be prohibited by the state from saying something. I believe that should be true for everyone, not just Lori Smith. But again, progressives have such a hard time seeing the principle of what's going on. They only see how their feelings are affected, how one particular person is affected. They only have such a myopic and I think an inaccurate view of cases like this. As this court has long held, Gorsuch says, the opportunity to think for ourselves and to express those thoughts freely is among our most cherished liberties and part of what keeps our republic strong. Of course, abiding the Constitution's commitment to the freedom of speech means all of us will encounter ideas we consider unattractive, misguided, or even hurtful. But tolerance, not coercion, is our nation's answer. The First Amendment envisions the United States as a rich and complex place where all persons are free to think and speak as they wish, not as the government demands. Because Colorado seeks to deny that promise, the judgment is reversed. So this is not about being able to discriminate or to uh, to deny services in general to someone who is gay or someone who considers themselves transgender or someone who identifies as whatever. It is about the state not being able to control someone's speech. I don't understand what's so difficult to comprehend about that. Um, And by the way, like you should be free to associate with whom you want to associate. Like you should be able to say, I'm going to run my company as you see fit. I saw a lot of people on the left saying, well, what if I don't want to, what if I don't want to associate with a Christian conservative? Like, what if I don't want to sell products to him? Look, I disagree with that. I think that's stupid and wrong. And by the way, that's not what's happening in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. That's not what's happening in 303 Creative case. But if like, if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to deny me service because I'm a Christian conservative, like. You could, I I mean, okay, yeah, I I do believe that there should be some freedom there. 
And I do believe that the market would take care of that. We already see that with the growing Christian conservative parallel economy that's cropping up right now. But that's not what's going on here. It is about a specific product and a specific message and the principle that the state should not be able to compel particular speech. So here's what the dissent said, which Gorsuch said is completely off base because it reimagines the facts of the case and doesn't even deal with the case at hand and doesn't even care really about the question of whether or not this violates a person's free speech rights. So Sotomayor says this, Uh, Today, the court, for the first time in its history, grants a business open to the public constitutional right to refuse to serve members of a protected class. This is, again, debunked by Gorsuch. That's not what this is about. This is, again, about a specific message that the state is trying to compel or prohibit. And she says this is a sad day in American constitutional law and in the lives of LGBT people. The Supreme Court of the United States declares that a particular kind of business, though open to the public, has a constitutional right to refuse to serve members of a protected class by issuing this new license to discriminate in a case brought by a company that seeks to deny same-sex couples the full and equal enjoyment of its services. The immediate symbolic effect of the decision is to mark gays and lesbians for second class status, of course, which is so ridiculous. Again, it's about what Gorsuch said, what... Uh, The concurrence said over and over again, the state cannot compel you to say something. The state cannot prohibit you from saying something. You should be able to express the ideas that you want to express in your business. Yes. So here's what uh, Sharon says so says, who is she is an Instagrammer. She's gained a very large audience and um She claims to not be on the right or the left. She claims to be somewhere in the middle and uh, as objective as possible, Um, only bringing you the facts, she says. Um, Here's something that she said. She answered a question. The question is, does the 303 decision open the door slash set precedent for more LGBT plus discrimination? She says, potentially, yes. Expect to see more businesses, business owners refusing to work with same-sex couples or members of the LGBTQ plus community, citing free speech and freedom of religion and for more cases to be filed according to this issue. And then she says... Okay, she answers this question. How is AA discrimination, affirmative action discrimination, but denying services to gay couples isn't? She says they're, they are saying that the website's designers, designers' right to free speech and to be free from government-compelled speech is more important than an LGBTQ couple's right to be free from discrimination. So, again, um, you're seeing a lot of this messaging that this is going to set a bad precedent for LGBT people to be discriminated against in general, rather than a focus on the issue at hand here. Again, the question of whether a state should be able to force you to say something that you don't agree with or prohibit you uh, from saying something. Of course, the Biden administration very sad about this. They said that um, the LGBTQ community's dignity and equality are being threatened. The promise of our democracy is being threatened by upholding the First Amendment, don't you see? Well, Kristen Wagner of um, of Alliance Defending Freedom has a response to some of these myths and this false narrative that is being pushed, that this is denying the dignity of LGBTQ people. Guys, like there are so many website designers, so many cake makers that you can go to. I'm sorry that someone doesn't agree with or want to affirm your lifestyle because of a faith that has been around for thousands and thousands of years that calls that sin. You're not going to be able to change that. And trying to employ the power of the state to compel someone to agree with you and affirm you and then to say you're the defenders of democracy, I'm sorry, but no. I mean, thank the Lord for the Supreme Court for protecting my free speech, but also yours. All of you who disagree with me, all of you who don't want to be compelled to create a message on your site or your cake that you disagree. You're not going to want to make a cake that celebrates a pro-life message. And I don't think the state of Texas should be able to compel you to. Like, it's pretty easy to get here. And I think a lot of people, unfortunately, are playing dumb. But thankfully, Kristen Wagner, she 
uh, she corrects the record on a lot of this. So I'll get into that correction in just a second. Let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day. And that is Cozy Earth. I absolutely love my Cozy Earth bedding. I'm getting some more Cozy Earth bedding for our guest room, which I'm super excited about. I'm getting some sheets and I'm getting a sham and I'm getting their waffle blanket. It's all so soft. It's temperature regulating. It's made out of bamboo viscous, which keeps you cool. And especially right now when it is hotter than anything outside and I am very pregnant, I really need my sheets to keep me cool Cozy Earth accomplishes that so well. Also, their loungewear is so luxurious, so comfortable, really high quality. If you're looking for good gifts, especially like a good wedding gift or a good gift for your wife or Lita Bros, you should look at the sheets, the loungewear from Cozy Earth. Right now, they've got an awesome deal going on. You can save save up to 40% on Cozy Earth items. Go to CozyEarth.com. Use promo code RELATABLE at checkout. 40%. That's incredible, guys. Super high quality stuff. CozyEarth.com, code relatable. CozyEarth.com, code relatable. Here is what... Here's what ADF attorney Kristen Wagner says. Disagreement isn't discrimination, and the government can't mislabel speech as discrimination to censor it. Uh, Lori works with everyone, including clients who identify as LGBT. As the court highlighted, her decisions to create speech always turn on what message is requested, never who requests it. The ruling makes clear that non-discrimination laws remain firmly in place and that the government has never needed to compel speech to ensure access to goods and services. As stipulated in the SCOTUS filing, Smith is willing to work with all people regardless of classification such as race, creed, sexual orientation, and gender and will gladly create custom graphics and websites for clients of any sexual orientation. She will not produce content that contradicts biblical truth regardless of who orders it. Heritage Foundation senior legal, uh, senior legal fellow. Uh, two fellows, actually, Thomas Jiping and Sarah Parshall Perry, uh, write that while most media outlets say that the case limits LGBTQ protections, the case wasn't about that at all. The Supreme Court held that the government cannot force you to say something that violates your religious beliefs. Lori Smith will not express a message that contradicts her personal beliefs, and she won't do it for anyone, no matter who they are. So if a, if if I go to Lori Smith and I say, please design this thing that this website that uh, celebrates, I don't know, something that the Bible calls sin, anything. Or like if, if I say, please make a website celebrating premarital sex, she's not going to do it. She doesn't agree with it. You know, Jack Phillips at the Masterpiece Cake Shop, like he won't even make Halloween cakes. This is not about denying services to a particular community. This is about the what. Again, not about the who. It's about the what. Uh, They go on to say this case is not about the customer's civil right. It is about Lori's constitutional right. So that kind of goes back to the assertion that Sharon says so made that this is about a constitutional right. It's not just about Christian conservatives. It's about it's about everyone's right to free speech. Time and again, even when the Supreme Court has been faced with anti-discrimination public accommodations laws like Colorado's, individuals subjected to those laws are still protected under the Constitution from having to express messages contrary to what they hold to be true. Um, we don't have time to get into all of the affirmative action bad takes out there. There's a lot that I there's a lot that I want to talk about with that. You're probably seeing how sad this is and how awful this is. We did talk about that a little bit last Thursday, so a week ago. So you can go back and listen to the summary of that. Of course, I think it's a very good thing. I think Clarence Thomas's concurrence should be read over and over again to understand why affirmative action is both not necessary. It doesn't actually right past wrongs. Um, It hasn't been very successful. And also it's not constitutional, which is what SCOTUS decides upon. Same thing when it comes to the student debt plan. It's not constitutional. The president didn't have the power to do that. Um, Go actually read the decisions. Read the decisions or at least parts of the decisions yourself before seeing all of this emotionalism on social media by saying that this is unjust and this is wrong. 
Is it constitutional? That's what the Supreme Court cares about. They don't, they're not deciding on whether something is moral or whether something is smart, whether something is wise, whether something should or shouldn't happen according to what the voters say. They care about the Constitution. and That's good. We have that check and balance for a reason. If President Biden, if he oversteps his bounds by enacting something like the Supreme Court's or uh, I mean, the student loan debt plan, then the Supreme Court is a check on that power to say, oh, you can't do that. You need to make it legislation. You need to go through Congress if you're going to do something like that. Um, so before you say, oh, this is so unjust, this is so terrible, all these bad things are happening, or before you're, before you believe your friends who are saying that, just go read the decisions for yourselves. I saw this series of really bad takes from an account called The Mom Attorney, and I, I, I guess just some progressive activist. And so here's what she says. This is what just happened in the Supreme Court. Thursday, policy protecting equity and access for people of color. No, we can't do that because that's discrimination. Friday, allow businesses to discriminate against LGBTQ community. Sure, go ahead. For, I mean, for an attorney, she shows such a profound ignorance and misunderstanding of what these cases actually decided of why it is discrimination to say, I'm sorry, but you have to reach a higher bar if you're white or Asian and you wanted to get get into Harvard versus if you're black, versus why it's not actually discrimination against a person for someone to, uh, for, uh, someone to deny a particular, expressing a particular message that is not in accordance with their beliefs. She then uses the Bible to justify her reasoning, if you can call it that. She says, looks like universities will need to provide affirmative action policies based on their religious beliefs. Quoting the Bible, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed, Psalm 82, 3 through 4. And this really gets to the heart of like a lot of of the so-called Christian responses to the affirmative action case. The Christian progressives, if you want to call them that, saying that this is affirmative action was righting the wrongs um, against oppressed people. Well, this is something that Clarence Thomas addresses, that you are making an assumption that someone is oppressed or that the current state that they're in has been affected by past oppression of people that looked like them and past discrimination of people that looked like them. Uh, rather than looking at that person as an individual and seeing what qualities they have, seeing what their background has been, uh, seeing what has actually put them in that situation, the assumption here is that Black people in America are all poor and they're all oppressed. That is an assumption. That's the assumption of critical race theory. That's the assumption of people who say uh, that all disparities today are due to past discrimination or current discrimination. And that's not necessarily true. There are people who may be oppressed of different skin colors. There are people who are black and who are brown who are not oppressed at all. Um, There are all kinds of factors that may affect disparities in someone's life, disparities between them and their neighbor, disparities between them and someone of a different skin color, someone of a different gender, someone of a different skill set. Again, discrimination and disparities by Thomas Sowell speaks to this really clearly, but so does Clarence Thomas in his concurrence. Um, I also saw, I think it was on the Be the Bridge Instagram page, saying, you know, mourning this decision. Uh, against affirmative action and also mourning the fact that uh, Asians are at the center of this case and therefore it's dividing Asians and black people and that is the work of white supremacy trying to uh, you know divide these two marginalized ethnicities or or races Um, so I've seen this a lot and apparently bothers some people on the left more that Asian people are allegedly being hoisted up by white supremacists to turn over affirmative action than they are bothered that Asian people are being discriminated against by affirmative action policies. Like that makes them more mad. They actually see it as like Uh, as Asian people being exploited by white supremacy, by being at the center of this case. 
uh, when in reality, look, Asian people have agency. That's something that I see on the left a lot is that they believe that the only kind of people who actually have agency, the only people responsible for their actions, the only people that could fight against progressive policies like defunding the police or uh, affirmative action, that the only people that could be consciously really doing that are white people. And every non-white person who lands on the conservative side of issues is just being used as a token by white people. Or maybe the Asian people in this affir- affirmative action case were tired of being discriminated against. We're tired of being told, I'm sorry, you have a really high GPA and you have really high test scores, but... You're not going to get in because we already have too many Asian people. That's what was happening. Remember the data set that we read on the show last week that um, an Asian person or a white person in, say, the 90th to 100th percentile when it came to their GPA, when it came to their test scores, were less likely to get into Harvard than the black applicant in the 50th percentile. That's not fair. Of course, that's discrimination. And so Like maybe Asian Americans were tired of being barred from opportunities. Maybe it had nothing to do with white supremacy at all. But you see how the left wing ideology, how this progressive race central ideology actually blinds you to the truth. Like it blinds you to reason. It blinds you to logic. It blinds you to reality so that you are forced to see things through a lens of partiality which God hates, God hates partiality. I'm reminded again of James 3, that the wisdom that from that is from above is impartial, is open to reason. Those that push this kind of critical race theory narrative constantly, which I'm, I'm over the phrase critical race theory, but it actually does have a meaning that we've defined very many times on this episode, social justice, racial justice, whatever you want to call it, intersectionality, those that push that narrative and that hold on to that idea, they're not open to reason. They're not impartial. They're not bringers of peace. They cannot see things as they actually are. They constantly have to interpret everything through the lens of black and brown oppressed white oppressor. And when you see things like that and you're unable to remove that lens, you are you are actually unable to enact justice or see what justice actually looks like because you can't see truth. And there is no justice without truth. There's no justice without impartiality. Um and so again, this person that I was just reading is perpetuating that idea. The assumption that all black and brown people are oppressed and poor. Actually, if you go back to God's law giving in ancient Israel, you will see that he hates partiality, that you are not to be partial either to the poor or to the great in a lawsuit. But in truth, but in truth, you are to, um, you are to enact justice. All right. So those are just some brief kind of Uh, general takes on some of these Supreme Court decisions. I know you've seen a lot of reactions going around. I hope that I've at least pointed you in the right direction. All right. I've got a little, little monologue to uh, celebrate, to commemorate the closing of Pride Month. And so we'll get to that in just a second. Let me pause. Let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day. And that is Good Ranchers. Good ranchers. We've still got uh we still got a lot of time to grill out with your family and your friends for the rest of the summer. You might as well do that with all American meat. That's where we get our meat from. It's all from Good Ranchers. It shows up at our front door on dry ice. We get our beef patties, our ground beef, all different cuts of steak. We've got better than organic chicken, pre-marinated, not pre-marinated. So you've got like the fajita chicken, you've got the Italian herb chicken, and then you've just got the plain chicken. There's also seafood. There are all different kinds of uh, combo options that you can see on their website. And if you subscribe, then you lock in that price of your box of meat every month for the next two years. You don't have to worry about inflation or anything like that. The biggest thing for us, I mean, in addition to the quality and that it's all American meat, is the convenience factor. I don't have to think about going to the grocery store and picking out the right cut of steak. I know that it's going to be high quality, ethically raised, sustainably sourced, and actually from American farms 
and ranches, not just manufactured here, but actually from livestock in America. That's what I love about it. Plus, it's a great company run by great people that share our values. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout to save $30. GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie to save $30. GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Okay, so it is the end of Pride Month. And something that we didn't get to, something that we, that we didn't get to was that crazy clip that was going around of the activists um, at a Pride Parade saying, we're here, we're queer, and we're coming for your children. So here's that. Okay, so here is how NBC responded to the backlash to that clip by conservatives on social media. NBC said the coming for your children chant has been used for years at Pride events, according to longtime March attendees and gay rights activists who said it's one of many provocative expressions used to regain control of of slurs against LGBTQ people. Oh, in that case, it's fine. Great. So there's a reason why you see more and more people saying, huh, maybe this isn't just about love is love, which, as I've said many times, is stupid and circular. If love is just love, if it can't actually be defined as anything, then love can be anything. It can be lust. It can be predation. It can be uh, fantasy. It can be just a feeling, just a declaration. If it's not substantive, if it's not rooted in anything, anchored in any kind of reality, then you see that the slippery slope is not a fallacy. If you can define love as anything, and if you justify anything by love, then you can see how perversion then is accepted, depravity then, predation then is accepted as uh, justifiable in the name of love, right? Thankfully, God's word gives us clarity. First John for eight tells us that God is love. First Corinthians 13 says love is patient and kind. One of the characteristics that it gives is that it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. So love is love makes no sense. It makes just as little sense as trans women are women. If you're not defining these terms, it's just circular. It's just stupid. They can just mean anything, which leads to anarchy. That's why it's so important for us to define our terms and why Christians should love truth and understanding and knowledge and wisdom so much. Um, But there's a reason why people are now kind of waking up to that. It's not just Christian conservatives, but people are seeing, oh, this slippery slope, it really wasn't a fallacy that my grandmother who said in 2012 that this is the beginning of the end or this is going to lead us down a bad path. Oh, she was right. Actually, she was more right than she realized, unfortunately, that we have slipped down the slope really quickly, that now they're just opening up with chants like they are praying upon your children. They're coming for your children, at the very least, trying to indoctrinate your children. Like you're going to get people who aren't just Christian conservatives having an aversion to that kind of thing who don't really care anymore about being called a quote-unquote homophobe or a transphobe, who say, well, now that you're involving kids, now that you're trying to talk to kids about this stuff, now that you're putting kids on puberty blockers, now that you're just being open about the predation, whether or not you want to say it's some kind of 40 chest to take over the slurs that have been used against you, we're not comfortable with that. Um, And still you see progressives, uh, calling people on the right transphobes or homophobes like it's something that really um is supposed to make a big difference and one of one of the craziest examples of that was this tweet by someone named katie montgomery i don't know who she is but this tweet he she i don't know uh this tweet got a lot of traction uh katie said the rage at trans women read men who dress up as women. Breastfeeding is just transphobia. So the rage of trans women breastfeeding is just transphobia. There's nothing else to it. It's healthy. Not that rare for non-birthing for the non-birthing mother to do in lesbian relationships, for example. There are even still wet nurses, which aren't which they aren't all raising raging about. It's just because it's trans. It's just because it's trans. And so 
why is this person even tweeting this? Well, unfortunately, this is a thing that happens. Men who put themselves on estrogen and then take these very, very strong hormone-laced drugs to try to induce lactation, um, they are trying to breastfeed children. Now, I think that this is probably a small portion of the American population, but the fact that it even happens at all, the fact that it's legal is very troubling. And then there is this, uh, there's this person who apparently has some influence who, um, who posted on social media that, let's see, uh, Gooseberry Orca on social media, he posted uh, himself trying to breastfeed an infant but also has other posts saying that he actually has some kind of nipple fetish, okay? So he has some kind of nipple fetish he is opening up about, and then he posts another picture trying to breastfeed his partner's baby. So it's obvious here that this is a fetish. And I think in all cases, in all cases where men are using babies to try to affirm their so-called gender identity, it is a sexual fetish. There's something pedophilic about it. There's something autogyna feel like about it. It has nothing to do with them actually thinking they're the opposite sex. It's seeing children as objects of kind of sexual and identity affirmation, which is perverse and should trouble absolutely anyone. It does trouble a lot of people, no matter how tolerant you think that you are. But here's my message to conservatives in the midst of all of this, because I see conservatives objecting to being called things like transphobe. They'll defend themselves saying transphobia means fear and I'm not scared of trans people. I just don't believe that men should be going into women's bathrooms, etc. That's not transphobic. Well, number one, defending yourself against their accusations and name calling is wasted time. The proper response to things like that is not, no, I'm not. It's, I don't care. I don't care. That's the proper response. And then number two, here's the thing. We actually should feel fear. Like we should fear men going into women's bathrooms. We should fear the female prisoners being forced to incarcerate, uh, forced to be incarcerated with men, many of whom have actually raped women. Uh, we should fear for the rape victims being forced to share space in abuse shelters with men. We should fear a world in which girls are forced to suppress their instincts and smile as males infiltrate their sororities, their teams, their locker rooms. And also, yes, like we should feel aversion too. We should have a strong aversion toward men trying to breastfeed babies. We should be averse to the idea that female is a costume to be donned for, or uh, an identity to declare. These fears and aversions are healthy. They're normal. They're logical. What they are not is irrational. And that is why the term transphobe is not accurate because phobia means an irrational fear or aversion, but the fear and aversion felt in this case, uh, they're extremely rational. So whether you believe that we are a product of evolution and we have the instincts that we do, the instinctive fears that we do because they were passed down from our ancestors to help us survive, or whether you know as I do, that we were made in the image of God, given by God the ability to discern obvious observable truths like differences between male and female, the fear and aversion people have to men trying to be women and enter their spaces, or the fear and aversion that people have to a group of a, a bunch of confused and lost and unstable people marching down the street and saying they're coming for your, your children— these are very innate and understandable fears and aversions. This doesn't mean that people who are confused about their gender are any less inherently valuable than anyone else. They're made in God's image like the rest of us. They're in need of Christ like the rest of us. I mean, I feel such pain in hearing the stories specifically of detransitioners who were victims of manipulation and negligence. I rejoice when I hear that they have heard the good news of the gospel and they believe, but the insistent denial of reality, particular, uh, particularly at the expense of women and girls when it comes to this movement of men identifying as women, is a thing to be feared and disdained. We can and we should hold all of these facts in mind at the same time. You can call it transphobia, whatever phobia you want. It's just the truth. And conservatives and Christians just need to be able to stand firm on that. You can call it whatever you want to. It's not an irrational fear. 
It might be a fear and aversion, but it's not irrational. It is completely logical. It's completely rational. It's completely reasonable because it is based on truth and we should never shy away from truth. Honestly, it's the most loving thing that we can do. Because remember, love isn't just love. Love rejoices with the truth, never in wrongdoing, as 1 Corinthians 13 says. And so that's what we remember and double down on all the time, but especially every year, is there's just the depravity is shoved into our faces and we see what the movement, what the activist movement actually is. Now, what we're talking about isn't characteristic of every single person who identifies as part of LGBTQ. That's not what we're saying. But the movement as a whole, the activist part of this, the push for this uh, is absolutely representative of something that is even darker than just sexual immorality and gender identity, but really, really comes from a place, I think, of yes, demonic oppression, but also just perverse predation. And it is something that you should have a fear of and an aversion to. Uh, It shouldn't steal your joy because you trust in a God who has promised to come back and to make all things right. And one day there will be no more sin, no more sadness, not just this kind of sin, but our own sin of um, whatever it is, of, uh, of pride, of distrust, of distrust of the Lord, of selfishness. All of these things one day will be gone and God will rule in perfect peace and enact perfect justice forever and ever and ever. So speak the truth and love, doing the next right thing, because that's all we can do, especially in the face of this chaos. All right, let me tell you about our last sponsor for the day, and then we will close out, and that is Eden Pure. So let me tell you about their thunderstorm air purifier. Their thunderstorm air purifier gets rid of any bacteria or odor in the air that you may not want. It gets rid of strong odors from cooking, cigarette smoke, litter boxes, trash cans, even that mildew smell from basements. The thunderstorm starts working in seconds to clear a room of any odor. There are no costly filters to ever replace. Uh, There have been over 350,000 thunderstorms already sold with thousands of five-star reviews. I have a great deal for you as well. If you go to EdenPureDeals.com, enter code Allie at checkout, uh, you can get three Three Thunderstorm air purifiers for under $200, which is a great deal. EdenPureDeals.com, code Allie. EdenPureDeals.com, code Allie. All right. That's all we've got time for today. Next week, I'm going to be at a different location. We're going to have all... um, we're going to have all, you know, our normal episodes that we usually have. We have a couple interviews that are exciting that we'll be recording next week. And then our normal, you know, uh, current events, culture type episodes that'll be coming out next week too. But I will be in a different location. So it might look and sound a little bit different, but same great relatable content. Um, As always, if you love this podcast, please leave us a five-star review. That would mean so much. And subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already. Um, And let us know if there's anything in particular you want us to uh, discuss next week. All right. Thanks so much for listening. We will be back here on Monday. (music) 